Uh, hello everyone, so here we are again today with a new topic. Uh, if you remember last time we discussed about the digestion of lipids, so we are moving on to the metabolism of lipids. And now we are going to see how fatty acids as uh, major energy sources for our cells are further degraded. So we are going to talk about uh, the fatty acid catabolism and beta oxidation of fatty acids. So speaking of beta oxidation of fatty acids, there is one other name which is uh, not that oftenly used, but we should know it. It's Linen cycle. And... Uh, it is important to point out that the processes of synthesis and degradation of fatty acids occur in numerous cells, in almost, almost all tissues and organs, but they are located in different cell compartments in different organelles. Uh, just as an overview, degradation of fatty acids occur in mitochondrial matrix. On the other side, the biosynthesis of fatty acids occur in cytosol, and we're going to discuss about it uh, in one of the upcoming videos. So, uh, speaking of the chemical characteristics of degradation of fatty acids, the degradation in human cell occur uh, following the beta oxidation type, uh, meaning that the central atoms... Uh, on, on which those oxidative processes are going to take place are going to be alpha and beta carbon atoms of fatty acids. Uh, degradation <clears throat> uh, of fatty acids uh, op provide a significant amount of energy for uh, the function of numerous tissues and organs like heart, skeletal muscles, kidney, uh, liver, but there are some tissues like nervous tissues and adrenal medulla, they cannot use fatty acids for getting energy. Or in other words, they can use only glucose uh, for obtaining energy. But uh, I have to make uh, just a small digression that uh, after uh, or under certain conditions, uh, brain cells can oxidize beta hydroxybutyrate which is an intermediate of beta oxidation and which is in other words a ketone body we're going to discuss it in some other videos so it can be oxidized to get some intermediates of glycolysis and Krebs cycle so uh, it can be used uh, indirectly uh, for the production of energy for brain cells but this is an exception and it's not a common pathway to get uh, amount, sufficient amounts of energy for, for, for nervous tissue. So like, like uh, almost all other metabolic pathways, uh, beta oxidation is also a complex pathway uh, consisting of several enzymatic reaction. And actually the central point of this degradation is going to be the bond between alpha and beta carbon atom between the second and the third carbon atom from the tioester bond. The final product of beta oxidation is acetyl coenzyme A, uh, which is going to enter, as you know, the third stage of catabolism. It can enter the Krebs cycle or it can be involved in some other metabolic pathway uh, depending on the current metabolic need of a cell. Uh, degradation of fatty acids is reversible process, so uh, the opposite direction is the fatty acid synthesis, but it is important now to state that uh, those two processes, despite the fact that they are reversible, they occur uh, in different, at different places, so uh, degradation in mitochondrial matrix, synthesis in cytosol, and because of that, different enzymatic systems are involved in those processes. So despite the fact that intermediates are going to be common for both processes. So anyway, uh, I like to uh, make an overview of the uh, overall metabolic pathway at the beginning uh, before uh, we move on to discuss those steps in details. So beta oxidation of fatty acids, as you can see from the figure, uh, consists of several phases. So there are one, two, three, four, five 
phases of beta oxidation. So let's explain them and then we're gonna uh, start providing some detailed information about each of these steps or phases. So uh, long chain fatty acids uh, are produced or released or hydrolyzed um, from three acid glycerols which are deposited in an adipose tissue. So when they uh, exit the <clears throat> when they exit the adipose tissue, they are brought by blood circulation to cells, and they the first event that uh, occur is the entrance or passage of those long chain fatty acids into the cytosol into the cell. Uh, this is completed by binding of fatty acids to one specific protein. We have already mentioned this protein in, in the chapter on digestion of lipids and that is fatty acid binding protein uh, which actually facilitate the entrance of fatty acids into the cell and uh, getting it ready for the step number two which is activation of fatty acid in the form of fatty acid coenzyme A. Uh, and then activated fatty acid can <clears throat> uh, is ready to pass the mitochondrial membrane in order to enter the mitochondrial matrix and this is achieved by one very specific uh, transport system which is called the carnitine shuttle system and we're going to explain that in details so when fatty acid enters the mitochondrial matrix it can enter beta oxidation spiral pathway or uh, beta oxidation cycle where uh, those intermediates are gonna enter repeatedly uh, the same sequence of four reactions in order to get the final product acetyl coenzyme A which uh, as we mentioned can enter Krebs cycle to produce energy and be degraded finally to carbon dioxide and water or acetyl coenzyme A can be redirected in liver uh, to the formation of ketone bodies. So these are steps one, two, three, four, five, uh, which actually represents an overview of the beta oxidation of fatty acids. So uh, let's go one by one. So the first stage of beta oxidation is the cellular uptake of uh, long chain fatty acids. So during fasting or uh, when there are increased metabolic needs for energy, uh, three acid glycerols which are accumulated and deposited in adipose tissue undergo hydrolysis upon the signals and action of hormones uh, and upon the action of several specific lipases. We're going to discuss that in some other videos. So TAGs are hydrolyzed and fatty acids are released into the bloodstream. So uh, fatty acids which are released upon TAG hydrolysis are then transported in the blood attached to the blood plasma albumin and when they reach cells they have to enter the cell by uh, the process of diffusion through membrane and actually uh, this is not a spontaneous process so this is a facilitated process because fatty acids uh, are actually bound to specific protein, fatty acid binding protein, FABP, uh, which is located in both membrane and in the cytosol. And actually the role of this and the function of this protein is to facilitate the transport of fatty acids through a cell membrane and to help the transport of uh, fatty acids through cytosol to mitochondrial membrane. Um, also, the purpose, if you remember, of this protein is to prevent the detergent activity of fatty acids, which could, uh, which could harm severely uh, the integrity of cell membranes and mitochondrial membranes. So uh, when fatty acid reaches cytosol, uh, we can move on to its activation. So the next stage is activation of long chain fatty acids. Let me remind you, those are fatty acids containing 20 to, uh, 12 to 20 carbon atoms. So the activation of um, fatty acids occurs in cytosol, uh, in endoplasmic reticulum, and this stage of beta oxidation is of special importance because uh, 
the upcoming beta oxidation of fatty acid will occur only if fatty acids are activated by binding to acetyl coenzyme A. So this is uh, this activation is a two-step reaction catalyzed by fatty acyl coenzyme A synthetase or theokinase. And let me explain uh, the principle of the reaction and the pathway. So fatty acid here, uh, like orange shaded uh, part of the molecule, uh, reacts with ATP forming acyl AMP molecule, meaning that acyl or uh, the, the residue of fatty acid is attached to AMP and they are bound to an enzyme. Then acyl AMP undergoes reaction or the transfer of acyl fragment to coenzyme A and AMP is released. So we get fatty acyl coenzyme A containing a uh, theoester bond, which is a high energy bond, if you remember, and this is why we call it an activated fatty acid. Um, upon the cleavage of ATP, we have the pyrophosphate type of cleavage, um, and as a result, we are going to get the release of pyrophosphate ion. Pyrophosphate ion is going to be degraded, uh, if you remember, we had it in a uh, glycogen metabolism by inorganic phosphatase to two molecules or to two ions of phosphate. So as you can see, we require, this process require ATP uh, both as a coenzyme and as a donor of energy. And remember that we have used two high energy bond because the degradation started uh, from ATP to AMP. So two high energy bonds are used for activation of one molecule of fatty acid. The enzyme fatty acyl coenzyme A synthetase or theokinase is an enzyme uh, which is located uh, at three points. Uh, it's located in endoplasmic reticulum, it's located in the outer mitochondrial membrane, and it's activated on, in mitochondrial membrane. This enzyme is specific because it does not act on uh, fatty acids with more than 22 carbon atoms, and we are going to have uh, some differences in the in the oxidation of these molecules, and I'm going to uh, spend some time explaining it later on. And it exhibits a rather low or just a little activity on fatty acids containing less than 12 carbon atoms. In peroxisomes, I have already uh, told you, uh, it's going to be a specific enzyme for very long chain fatty acids. And in mitochondrial matrices uh, of kidney and liver cells, uh, we're going to have a separate enzyme for medium length chain fatty acids. So they're going to be different from those long chain fatty acid activation. The third stage, or the, I'm sorry, the, the, the next stage is transport of activated long chain fatty acids into mitochondria. So we, we mentioned that enzymes of beta oxidation are, are located in mitochondria. So first we have to transport activated fatty acid acyl coenzyme A from cytosol into mitochondria. But there is uh, one problem to be solved because inner mitochondrial membrane is impermeable for acyl fatty acyl coenzyme A of long chain fatty acids. Those with short and medium uh, chain fatty acids, they have no problem of the transport through mitochondrial membrane. We mentioned it in the chapter of digestion, but it, when we are talking about long chain fatty acid, we have a problem. They cannot pass the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane. So if we need a transport and we need a transport, that means that we need to organize uh, some kind of uh, efficient carrier uh, to enable the entrance of activated fatty acid into the mitochondrial matrix. And this molecule, uh, which is going to have uh, the function of a carrier, is going to be carnitine molecule, and it's going to be incorporated in, in a system uh, which is called a shuttle system. 
and the basis of this shuttle system as you can see from the figure is going to be the binding of acyl coenzyme A uh, to carnitine molecule which is quaternary ammonium salt so it, it, it fatty acid actually reacts or it's bound to hydroxyl group of carnitine forming acyl carnitine ester so this is an ester bond so the whole system is marked as carnitine shuttle system and Actually, it consists of the uh, activity of two isoenzymes car of, acyl, uh, of carnitine acyl transferase. So those two isoenzymes are carnitine acyl transferase 1 and carnitine acyl transferase 2. And they catalyze the reversible transfer of acyl group from acyl coenzyme A to carnitine and, and opposite from carnitine to uh, coenzyme A and so on. Uh, the molecule of carnitine uh, is the molecule which can be synthesized in our organism but it's also uh, obtained from uh, obtained from diet. Uh, it can be synthesized in the liver and in skeletal muscles uh, from the side chain of amino acid lysine and for the biosynthesis we need the action of s adenosylmethionine for the transfer of atomic group and vitamin c uh, but, but the exact pathway of carnitine biosynthesis uh, will be explained and provided later on when we move on on the metabolism of amino acids and proteins so so far uh, it's just important to know that there are sufficient amounts of carnitine available in our organism for the purposes of uh, transport of activated fatty acids from cytosol to mitochondrial matrix so let's explain the exact mechanism so there is a figure explaining the activity of those two isoenzymes so in, in the top left part of the figure uh, we can see the activation of a fatty acid undergoing the acyl coenzyme a synthetase catalyzed reaction with coenzyme a and the energy is provided by ATP and the pyrophosphate cleavage of two high energy bonds to AMP and pyrophosphate. So we get fatty acyl coenzyme A. So fatty acyl coenzyme A can pass the outer mitochondrial membrane and in the outer side, uh, side of inner mitochondrial membrane, we have carnitine uh, palmitoyl transferase 1 or palmitoyl acyl transferase uh, one if we are if we are dealing with some other uh, fatty acids so uh, fatty acyl coenzyme uh, a undergoes the reaction in the manner that acyl group is transferred from coenzyme a to carnitine so coenzyme a is released and fatty acid is now attached to carnitine so we get an ester fatty acyl carnitine this ester fatty acyl carnitine can now passage through the inner mitochondrial membrane by the action of an enzyme translocase. Carnitine acyl transferase 2 is an enzyme attached on the inner side of inner mitochondrial membrane and the catalytic function is a transfer of acyl fragment from carnitine back to coenzyme A so we get fatty acyl coenzyme again that we had in cytosol and we have the carnitine released from the system. Carnitine can return to the cytosolic side of mitochondrial membrane by the action of translocase again. Uh, remember and notice that this coenzyme A is used for mitochondrial matrix pool of coenzyme A and not the one which was found in cytosol. So once uh, fatty acyl coenzyme A is in the mitochondrial matrix, it can undergo beta oxidation. So the last phase, the third stage, is beta oxidation of fatty acid. And actually it consists of four repeating reactions, which are represented here in the figure. So one, two, three, four. And those reactions are repeated. So the whole pathway has... Uh, some kind of unique uh, spiral form or helical form or cyclic form so in each of these cycles uh, one acetyl coenzyme a is removed from the molecule and the molecule which is 
shortened for two carbon atoms is brought back to the new cycle or to the new turn of helix undergoing uh, the same one, two, three, four reactions. So how many uh, rotations of the cycle or how many uh, turns of this helix is calculated by the equation n half minus one. So for example, if we want to hydrolyze, I mean, if we want to oxidize and to degrade palmitic acid containing 16 carbon atoms, uh, we're going to have seven cycles of beta oxidation so seven repetitions of those four reactions so let's go through these four reactions and define them just briefly before we go into details so the first reaction reaction number one is dehydrogenation of the bond between alpha and beta carbon atoms of fatty acid coenzyme a thus producing a double bond and reducing equivalents are transferred to FAD coenzyme. In the second reaction, we are adding water, molecular water to the double bond, so we get beta hydroxy derivative, beta hydroxy acyl coenzyme A, and the special enzyme is involved in catalyzing this step. The third step is again uh, oxidation reaction or dehydrogenation reaction but this time OH group is oxidized to keto group so we get ketoacyl coenzyme A and we have the formation of one reduced NADH coenzyme and the final step is the cleavage of those uh, two fragment two carbon fragment molecules I mean the cleavage of one acetyl coenzyme A and the rest of the molecule shortened uh, rest of the molecule undergoes the upcoming and the repeating uh, four steps of beta oxidation until uh, the uh, complete fatty acid molecule is degraded to acetyl coenzyme A. So we can start uh, one uh, reaction after another. So as you can see, reaction number one is the first dehydrogenation or the first oxidation, which means the uh, oxidation of uh, acyl coenzyme A at uh, alpha and beta carbon atoms, as I've already mentioned, so this is alpha or two carbon atom, uh, this is beta or third carbon atom, so reducing equivalents are removed and captured by FADH coenzyme, and we have the formation of double bond, and we are getting the intermediate, which is called alpha beta D hydroacyl coenzyme A or transenoyl coenzyme A. The enzyme which catalyzed this reaction is marked as fatty acyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase and it requires the FAD coenzyme which is reduced to FADH. FADH uh, can enter the electron transport system which is going to be important when calculating the energy yield of beta oxidation of fatty acid. A small digression regarding this fatty acyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase enzyme. The inherited deficiency of this enzyme uh, can be or is considered to be one of the possible causes of so-called sudden death syndrome in children uh, because if there is a deficiency of this enzyme, uh, beta oxidation of fatty acid is inhibited, uh, which means that uh, the production of energy will be depleted and uh, degradation of glucose cannot provide sufficient amounts of energy for the proper function of cells, tissues and organs. So it is a huge problem. The second reaction is hydrotation, as you saw, that is the addition of the molecule of water to double bond. So molecule of water is added to double bond and we get the attachment of hydroxyl group on beta carbon atom or the third carbon atom. So we get 3L hydroxyacyl coenzyme A and the enzyme catalyzing this reaction is marked as N-oil coenzyme A hydrotase or there is one other name in use as well and it's crotonase. The third reaction is second dehydrogenation or the second oxidation uh, which is nothing else but the oxidation of hydroxyl group 
of uh, beta hydroxy acyl coenzyme A to beta keto acyl coenzyme A to keto group and the enzyme is beta L hydroxy acyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase requiring the presence of NAD coenzyme which is going to be reduced to NADH coenzyme uh, which can also enter the electron transport system and it's going to be important for us when calculating the energy yield of the pathway and finally the fourth reaction is theolytic cleavage uh, and in this reaction one molecule of acetyl coenzyme A is removed from ketoacyl coenzyme A and as a second product we get acyl coenzyme A but this time shortened for two carbon atoms so for example if we have started with uh, palmitoyl coenzyme A containing 16 carbon atoms two are removed in the form of acetyl coenzyme A so we have remaining 14 which is going to be myristyl coenzyme A which goes back to the reaction number one and undergoes the new turn of the spiral or the new turn of the cycle of beta oxidation. Uh, the enzyme which, it, which catalyzes this last uh, reaction is beta ketoacyl coenzyme A theolase. Uh, what is the energy yield of beta oxidation? So uh, in each rotation of the cycle or in each turn of the helix uh, and on the spiral, I'm sorry, uh, we have the formation and removal of one acetyl coenzyme A and we have the formation of one reduced FAD coenzyme and we have the formation of one reduced NADH coenzyme. So I'm going to explain the calculate calculus of energy yield uh, in the on the example of palmitic acid because it's the most simple and you can try it on some other at home uh, containing 16 carbon atoms. So we have calculated previously that we have to uh, turn seven cycles of beta oxidation. So in the end, we're going to get eight acetyl coenzyme A's. Uh, remember, a lot of students. Uh, are confused at that point because the last turn, the seventh turn of the cycle is going to uh, cleave the four carbon molecule into two carbon molecules. So instead of one acetyl coenzyme A in the last turn, you're going to get two acetyl coenzyme A's, which is, which is going to give in total eight acetyl coenzyme A's. And of course, we have seven FAD reduced coenzyme and seven NAD reduced coenzyme and now uh, there is something that you are very familiar with so acetyl coenzyme a we have discussed about it it enters the Krebs cycle and we know from our previous lectures that one rotation one round of Krebs cycle provides 12 ATPs so if we have eight acetyl coenzyme A's multiplied with 12 ATPs it's going to give us 96 ATPs FADH coenzyme can enter, if you remember, uh, electron transport system providing two ATP molecules. So seven FADHs times two ATP molecules uh, equals 14 ATP molecules. NAD reduced when entering electron transport system provides the formation of three ATP molecules. So seven times three, 21 ATPs. When we add all of these ATPs, 96 plus 14 plus 21, we give the total amount of 131 ATP molecules for the upon the degradation of palmitic acid. But we have to take into account the two high energy bonds are used for the activation of fatty acid. So we have to subtract that from the amount and it's going to give us the final result, the finer energy yield of the total and complete degradation of palmitic acid to carbon dioxide in the water, and it's 129 ATPs. Uh, I, I have to uh, make a, a short digression here. Um, anyway, in, in some of the other literature uh, sources and um, uh, which are uh, up to date, uh, you, you will find an energy yield which is different from this one. Uh, but I'm using this one which is, uh, uh, which is adjusted to the needs of students and those uh, basic biochem knowledge in those student textbooks. Because nowadays we know that uh, the events which take place in um, electron transport system are not 
uh, as the events we thought they are previously. So, for example, the entrance of one FAD in electron transport system is going to provide a net flow of electrons which uh, are going to provide a synthesis of not two ATPs but the one and a half ATP. Uh, the similar story is for NADH coenzyme. When calculating the exact number of electrons which are actually flowing through electron transport system, those are going to be 10 electrons and 4 needed for NADH, uh, from NADH which is going to be, for ATP which is going to be 2.5 ATPs and not 3 ATPs. So if you take those corrections into consideration, so uh, it's not going to be 12 ATPs per turn of Krebs cycle, it's going to be less uh, and it's not going to be 7 times 2, it's going to be 7 times 1.5 and it's not going to be 7 times 3, it's going to be 7 times uh, 2.5. So the final energy yield, uh, it's going to be less than 129, it's going to be 100. 28 minus 2 for activation so it's going to be I think 106 so you can you can try to calculate that at home so but we're not insisting of on, on complicated uh, on complicating the situation because you know it's hard to understand that uh, one NADH is gonna provide two and a half molecules because it's not possible to synthesize half of the molecule but anyway uh, this is just right good and right enough but uh, I'm emphasizing this just not to get confused if you read something else in outsources uh, but anyway uh, what uh, about other fatty acids from diet so uh, in our diet especially in, in plant origin food uh, there are some fatty acids containing odd chain length fatty acids so with the odd numbers of carbon atoms uh, so these odd chain length fatty acids uh, they undergo the same pathway as uh, fatty acids with even the number of carbon atom until three carbon remains uh, so uh, until we get the propionyl coenzyme A. So we're removing uh, acetyl per acetyl coenzyme A, two per two carbons, until we uh, get the last one containing three carbon atoms, which is propionyl coenzyme A. Uh, so this propionyl coenzyme A undergoes uh, two-step uh, modifications. So the first step is carboxylation of propionyl coenzyme A to methylmalonyl coenzyme A by the action of propionyl coenzyme A carboxylase enzyme. Uh, since this is the carboxylation reaction, uh, we remember and we know very well that we need biotin as a coenzyme. And of course, for the synthesis of the new chemical bond, we require the energy in the form of ATP. Then uh, D-methylmalonyl is isomerized to L-methylmalonyl and then it undergoes the second stage of modification which is isomerization to succinyl coenzyme A by the enzyme methylmalonyl coenzyme A mutase which requires vitamin B12 or cobalamin for the reaction, actually hydroxycobalamin for this reaction. Succinyl coenzyme A, uh, if you remember, is a very well-known intermediate of the Krebs cycle. So succinyl coenzyme A enters Krebs cycle and undergoes uh, the very well-known changes until it reaches L-malate. But from L-malate, it's not gonna be transformed to oxaloacetate because uh, it closes uh, and the, the Krebs cycle, but rather L-malate from this point is going to be converted to pyruvate by so-called malic enzyme. Uh, we mentioned it before, uh, and it requires, it is an NADP-dependent uh, enzyme forming NADPH, and it is the reaction of decarboxylation. And then pyruvate um, can be transport, transformed into numerous other molecules, if you remember, our story on the fates of pyruvate depending on the, on the current um, metabolic needs of the cell. Uh, but not only odd chain length fatty acids are found in uh, our diet, uh, also 
unsaturated fatty acids are found in our diet and approximately half of the dietary fatty acids are actually unsaturated and the most common unsaturated fatty acids in our diet are oleic and linoleic acid so uh, if you remember the structure of these fatty acids though they have cis uh, double bonds so which cannot be recognized by the enzymes of beta oxidation so they have to be either isomerized into trans configuration and brought to the between the second and the third carbon atom or they have to be reduced so i'm going to show you at the example of linoleic acid how this pathway occur so we need to introduce two more enzymes into the pathway which are enoyl coenzyme a isomerase and 2,4 dienoyl coenzyme a reductase so if you take a look at this figure uh, we have linoleoil coenzyme a undergoing the normal uh, beta oxidation of fatty acid and removal of one two three acetyl coenzyme a's uh, following those steps that we have explained so three spirals of beta oxidation until we reach uh, those cis uh, double bonds this time between the third and the fourth and between the sixth and the seventh carbon atom now uh, we have the action of uh, the first additional enzyme enoyl coenzyme a isomerase which role is to transfer this double bond between uh, the second and the third carbon atom thus changing its configuration to transform like it's explained here so it's going to be trans 2 cis 6 then uh, this part of the molecule can undergo again one normal uh, spiral of beta oxidation and it can go undergo the first step of second spiral which is the first dehydrogenation and the formation of a uh, double bond between alpha and beta carbon atoms but now we have to solve the problem with the second uh, cis double bond and in this case we are introducing the second enzyme 2,4 dienoyl coenzyme I reductase which is NAD uh, pH requiring or dependent enzyme so this bond, double bond is going to be reduced so we have only one bond between the third and the fourth carbon atom and now enoyl coenzyme A isomerize is going to isomerize this bond again to convert it to be found between the alpha and beta carbon atoms and then again we can uh, introduce the rest of the steps of beta oxidation actually four spirals to degrade the rest of the molecule containing 18 carbon atoms uh, but apart from unsaturated fatty acids we also have fatty acids with very long chain fatty acids containing 24 or 26 carbon atoms and those fatty acids are exclusively degraded in peroxisomes and peroxisomes are responsible for shortening those uh, huge long chains uh, to shorten it to something acceptable uh, which can enter the mitochondria so fatty acids undergo the same chemical changes but different enzymes are involved in such a process and actually uh, this degradation in peroxisome is explained by five steps so the first step is diffusion of fatty acids to peroxisomes uh, by the mechanism of direct transport which is a difference because if you remember we have a, a facilitated transport with FABP protein uh, in, in normal uh, fatty acid long chain fatty acids then the second phase is activation uh, with the enzyme peroxisomal acyl coenzyme A synthetase and the third stage is shortening of the chain uh, until it reaches approximately usually up to eight carbon atoms so such a shortened uh, chain now undergoes phase four uh, which is the formation of an ester with carnitine and that enables 
the exit of shortened fatty acid by diffusion and the last phase the entrance of acyl carnitine ester to mitochondria where it undergoes uh, the normal beta oxidation of fatty acid until uh, till um, the completion of the degradation in the form of acetyl coenzyme A. So uh, there are actually three enzymes which are characteristic here. So the first one is fatty acyl coenzyme A oxidase this time, so it's not uh, dehydrogenase, because this time, despite the fact that this enzyme is FAD requiring enzyme, but the transfer of electrons is not going to be to FAD coenzyme, uh, it's going to be to molecular oxygen. So uh, as a result of this transfer, uh, hydrogen peroxide is going to be formed. And because of, uh, because of the fact that there is no FADH uh, produced here, uh, we're going to have two ATPs less when calculating the energy yield. What about the hydrogen peroxide which is formed? It, it has to be neutralized and it's going to be neutralized by catalase to water uh, and there are significant amounts of catalase in peroxisome due, due, to, due to these needs. Uh, the second enzyme is actually the combination of two enzymes from uh, the mitochondrial part of uh, oxidation that is enoyl coenzyme A hydratase and beta hydroxyacyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase for the hydration and the, the second dehydrogenation. Actually, in peroxisomes, uh, we have one B functional enzyme with two active centers completing both hydration and the second dehydrogenation. And the last one is thiolase, uh, which does not act on acyl coenzyme ACE with less than eight carbon atoms. So these are some of the differences, but when those differences are solved and overcome, the rest of the degradation uh, is completed upon that classical uh, sequence of steps that we have already mentioned. And uh, to conclude this chapter and this topic, uh, we have to say a couple of words about the regulation of beta oxidation of long chain fatty acids. So there are actually two types of uh, regulation. It's short-term regulation and long-term like, regulation. When we are talking about short-term regulation, actually we mean uh, the changes in enzyme activities which occur. And here the major regulatory factor is melonyl coenzyme A, which is an intermediate of fatty acid biosynthesis, which is going to be our next topic in the next video. So melonyl coenzyme A in inhibits carnitine acyl transferase 1. So as a result of this inhibition, there is no passage of fatty acids to mitochondria and beta oxidation and production of acetyl coenzyme A and energy is stopped at this phase. Uh, speaking of the long-term regulation, uh, here we have the changes in enzyme concentration, not the activity, but the concentration. And this regulation is actually completed um, by certain actions at the nucleus level. So because of that, uh, there is more time that has to pass in order to have the effect of such a regulation. So sometimes it takes hours, sometimes it takes even days uh, to see the change and to see uh, the regulation. And here, the main regulatory factors are hormones, predominantly insulin and glucagon, in a very similar way that we have discussed for uh, their impact on, 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 glyco on carbohydrate metabolism. But we're going to discuss about the effects of insulin and glucagon on fat met and lipid metabolism later on, so I'm not going to uh, torture you right now with this. And of course, to conclude the topic, uh, the last thing to emphasize is that uh, the rate of beta oxidation also depends on the availability of fatty acids from adipose tissue. So in cases where lipolysis, degradation of TAGs uh, is enhanced, you're going to have uh, an increased influx of fatty acids into the cell. And if you have uh, a lot of reactants available, a lot of substrates available, probably 
all those enzymatic reactions are going to be pronounced, are going to be enhanced, and this process is going to be activated. So anyway, uh, my dear colleagues, my dear students, that was more or less everything that you need to know about the beta oxidation of fatty acid, one very important metabolic pathway uh, providing us with the major amount of energy for the function of our organism. So uh, until the next topic, uh, we're probably we're going to stay with fatty acids, but this time with, the, with, with their biosynthesis. Uh, please stay safe. Uh, stay healthy and bye-bye.